thank you very much. Um, I feel extremely honoured and humbled by sharing this platform this afternoon with so many eminent speakers from such a diverse background. I am just a frontline food soldier, okay, in the sector of health, trying to bring healthcare to countries that have got limited resources. I'm going to tell you a story, okay, of my own personal journey in the context in my own specialty and my special interest is in HIV and tuberculosis. I left Malaysia, Kuching, Sarawak, where I was born at a young age and went to university at University of Newcastle upon Tyne and graduated in 1983 marked the date of 1983. During my clinical years in 1981, there was a description in the medical, medical literature of five very young individuals in San Francisco in America who were dying of an unusual opportunistic infection called pneumocystis carinae pneumonia. No one actually knew what it was a year later, individuals described that these individuals who died from it were severely immunocompromised and therefore came up with a term called acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, AIDS. So I'm going to give you my personal story, okay, and my journey into this particular aspect of a disease that I've got a special interest in in terms of education, research, and bringing access to treatment to people in other parts of the world who are less fortunate than practically all of us sitting here in this room. So, HIV was defined in 1982. That is just one year before I graduated in 1983. People have actually looked into where has this disease come from. This disease has come as far back as 1959. Okay? And at that stage, no one actually knew what had actually caused this particular syndrome. They knew that it is an infection that could be transmitted through blood, semen, vaginal secretions, and breast milk. Essentially, bodily fluids. Within a year, the virus was identified, and there were two sorts, HIV-1, HIV-2. We know about HIV-2 a bit better than HIV-1 at this moment in time. HIV-1, we think, has come from the chimpanzee okay, origin, and HIV-2, there's no doubt, is from the Suti Mangabi apes. My interest in this came along as, yes, I knew that this existed when I graduated, but during my training in United Kingdom, hardly seen the case. But it was when I was a registrar in a peripheral unit in one of the biggest ID unit in the country, in United Kingdom in Manchester, that I came across this particular gentleman when I was a registrar on call. He was a scholar on the Commonwealth Scholarship that has come from Nigeria, and he was writing his thesis. And because he was writing his thesis, he was very, very busy ignoring a lot of these constitutional symptoms of high fever, unwell, loss of appetite, not sleeping very well. So when I first saw him, when he got admitted to Monsell Hospital in Manchester, he only came in because he noticed this big neck swelling in his neck that was coming, become uncomfortable. So it intrigued me, okay, so what could this big mass swelling in his neck due to? So being a young enthusiastic registrar in training, I took a needle and a syringe under septic condition, aspirated that lesion, that swelling, and all what it came out was pus extremely unusual. Is this what has caused this gentleman 
systemic symptoms. So the first thing that came to my mind is because at that stage of my career, I had an interest in tuberculosis. So this could well be tuberculosis, okay? So I arranged for a lot of the investigation to be undertaken to th in this gentleman. And indeed, within two hours, we saw the organism and empirically the diagnosis that this is an atypical infection due to mycobacterium was established and he was started on treatment. I then went back to him and talked to him and asked him, have you heard of this particular condition called HIV? He says, no. He says, I've read about it, okay, and 1997 was the start of the HIV epidemic in the United Kingdom. People were just seeing a string of cases coming through, and that's the first one in our unit in that country. He agreed to be tested for HIV, and at that period in time, it will take four to five days because the specimen has to go down to London and call in there to be tested. That was in 1997. And I can imagine at that time the anxiety of him waiting for the results and me getting rather anxious. Okay, what do I tell him? Okay, five days to wait for a results that you thought it could be due to, okay, in that particular uh, setting. That sparked my interest in tuberculosis in the context of HIV. And indeed, his blood test was positive, okay? And that it subsequently grew that he had tuberculosis. So that started off my interest in actually seeing patients with tuberculosis and to the young audience, okay, experience and looking into what could come subsequently is important because that gave me my first publication in a very highly cited journal called the Quarterly Journal of Medicine. I described, okay, with my boss at that time who was very supportive, okay, in the context of nine TB patients, and imagine this is in 1991, okay, this was the first case series of TB and HIV in the United Kingdom published, okay, in that context. So then you're going to say to me, ah, how did you then develop this interest further? TB and HIV in the United Kingdom, in a well-resourced country, how common it is? No, and then I focus my mind in terms of where else in the world could you actually see a lot of this co-infection okay, in this context? And this sparked my interest okay, and looking into and understanding in the subsequent 36 years of my professional life, I am fortunate to be able to give you now some of that personal story in looking at the natural history, understanding the virology, how the disease affects the human host and how the human host responds to it, and really trying to think through at the beginning where this is a disease with potentially with literally no effective treatment to its current day that is now considered to be a curable, treatable, chronic long-term condition that people walking around with the condition if they're under good medical health care and under good medication can lead a normal survival lifespan like you and me. Isn't that amazing? From a disease that is once thought to be deadly to a disease that is now chronic, okay, in that context. So what have we learned? We learned that over the course of the infection, that if some individual get infected and he or herself doesn't come forward to be tested or seen himself at risk for HIV, he could then go into what we call an asymptomatic stage, i.e. with no symptoms. So that individual could lead a normal asymptomatic life for up to eight to 10 years, okay? But that individual, if he or she is not tested or being actually offered testing, is a potential source of transmission. So that's what we have learned, okay, in the context. We have also learned 
that tuberculosis is the most commonest co-infection in the individual with HIV in the world as a whole. And despite all the major advances in treatment, it is a risk throughout the course of the infection. Even with good effective treatment to treat the HIV, that risk never returns to baseline. So it is a real challenge. So what can we do about it and what can we think? Particularly, this disease affects okay, a number of countries with poor resources and WHO has regarded these countries okay, in the context that it is such an urgent medical problem that on every year, 24th of March is World TB's Day. And what it tells you? Most leading cause of death with people living with HIV? People living with HIV are up to 20 times more likely to fall ill with TB. In 2011, 10 million people fell ill with TB and there were 1.6 million deaths from the disease. UNAIDS is trying to work with relevant partners in poor resource countries in particular to reduce TB associated death among people living with HIV by 75% by 2020. We only got one more year left. Okay? And 300,000 people died from AIDS related TB in 2011, 2017. So it is a curable disease. That's the main focus, okay? 54 million lives have been saved since 2000. So therefore, what should we do with actually helping and assisting poor resource settings? Simple, affordable, effective HIV programs, like for example, people living with HIV should have access to treatment they should have diagnostics of, for diagnosis of TB, regular TB uh, screening, and prevention program. So where have I gone to? You probably heard from the introduction, the three main countries that I've done a fair bit of work with, collaborative work, working with local partners in those world, okay, is Myanmar, Nigeria and South Africa. I am going to tell you more of my experience with the latest involvement that I have since 2014 in Myanmar. I'm sure I don't have to remind you know, the audience where Myanmar is, but I have spoken in a number of other settings, particularly in European countries, where they are not quite sure where this country is, okay, in that context. It's so synonymous with Burma, okay, I'm sure I don't have to tell you that. It's a country with about 52 million people with very, very diverse ethnic group. That's where the challenge is, okay. The majority of people are Burma, okay, nearly 68%. And that's the country, and it's challenging because it borders between Bangladesh, India, China, Laos, Thailand. Okay. Mm. The hard-to-reach key population of individuals that is infected with HIV in that part of the world is a quarter of them. A quarter of them are injecting drug users. And nearly about 6% of them are men who have sex with men. And look at that 5% population of female sex workers. They are just about, if you think about it, the hardest to reach population. And that's where my focus is. TB. In that part of the world, 200,000 cases per year. Okay a figure that is actually sometimes quite difficult to comprehend. And if you look at this is drug-resistant TB, you're talking about nearly 14,000 cases a year. Okay? And I'm not going to bore you too much about all the other data that is in there, but i just like you to actually keep those two figures in mind. More majority of my work are done in this eight clinics which is in the periphery of Burma. Four of them are outside Yangon, 
two of them are in the Kanjin state, one in the Mon state, and one in the Kayin state. There are areas of Burma that are very difficult to access. You think that riding on an elephant is great fun, but I can tell you that the novelty weighs off after the second or third trips, okay, because these areas are sometimes are only accessible by using the great beast of burden, the elephants, okay, in that context. The structure of these clinics are modified and actually built to suit the local setting. And if you can see, okay, this are uh, one of the clinics, it has got double roofing because out there, the temperature environmental wise is about 36 degrees. But with that double roofing, it co the air causes an insulation. Therefore, inside the clinic setting is about 24 degrees, which I can actually work quite comfortably. All the clinics are built on stilts, okay, in the context that because when it rains, the whole area is waterlogged. If it is not on stilts, the whole clinic setting will be swept away. Literacy rate is extremely, extremely low. And I'm delighted to hear from a previous speaker about innovative ways of teaching and education. And this is what we do. Because if people can't read and write, you teach them using charts and drawings. And because we provided this health care free of charge at point of delivery, practically everyone that lives around that part of the, where the clinics are come to that clinics to access the health care. Otherwise, they, if they go to any of the other hospital settings, they would have to pay, irrespective of whether you are working or not. So that's the clinic environment that we work in, and that's the laboratory facilities, okay, which is point of care, just next to the clinics, okay. These are pa patients all waiting to be seen, okay, in the context that's a one of the consulting rooms, okay, and these are three of the consulting rooms, all very much tailored, okay, that is easily accessible, and patients can be seen fairly promptly, and point of care testing can be undertaken. Now, I don't speak the Burmese language, okay? So I rely on a lot of goodwill. I can speak Malay, Hokkien, English, okay? In the context, a bit of Mandarin, but trying to learn Burmese is actually very challenging, okay? So I rely on a lot of uh, the other doctors telling me about uh, uh, how to actually uh, 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 interpret a lot of the clinical symptoms. That's the inpatient facilities, okay, in the context that simple, effective, okay, and very airy, okay, in the context, so that you do not have to be looking after patients in an environment of 34, 35 degrees. And this is, again, another shot of the clinic settings that we work in. Practically, most of our laboratory investigations are based on what we call point-of-care testing devices. Remember what I said to you. That thing always sticks into my mind. My first memorable patient that it took five days for his HIV results to come in. Can I tell you what we do these days? If someone comes in, well, we think that it's got possibility of, T of HIV, point-of-care finger prick testing kit that gives me a result literally within 10 minutes. That is innovation for you. Point of care testing kit. This is what we have actually emphasized on. Okay. There are some conditions that unfortunately you still need machinery like a microscope to make the final diagnosis like malaria. Okay, there are point of care testing devices for malaria, but it's not specific to the particular species of malaria that you're trying to look for. So she is just about, we've trained her, just about one of the best microscopies. If there's any malaria parasites that you want to find, she is the one that's going to find it, okay, in the context. Innovation in cabinets for processing of specimens. This is done collaboratively with a local carpenter. We could not have afforded a Category 3 cabinets 
that cost tens of thousands of pounds. But we have used the local carpenter to actually innovate and this costs, in real terms, 30 pounds, i.e. about 150 ringgit. Okay, that is, again, innovation for you. Getting a secure supply of medication is important. Okay, in the context that this is 100% externally funded from agency, as shown here, and again, secured supply, okay, in the context of you need to make sure that patient will have enough drugs for them to go home after being seen and having diagnosed with the condition. Because it would have taken some of them three to four days to come to the clinic, okay? You would lose them in that context. So what do we do with TB? When a patient has been diagnosed with TB, a six-month supply of the medication is dedicated for that particular individual so that we know there is no break in continuity of the supply of the drugs. That supply of drugs cannot be shared. It's all earmarked. And you can see the numbers there. These are all patient numbers. So that six-month supply is protected, secured for that particular individual so he can finish his treatment. The problem about drug-resistant TB in that part of the world is shortage of secured long-term supply of the drugs. The drug simply runs out, okay, and the patients are left with no medication because you need up to six months of treatment for a successful treatment for your TB. We introduce multidisciplinary team meeting. The people on the photograph in blue are medics. The others are social workers, community health workers, psychologists, and counsellors. So we meet weekly, okay, in the context to talk about patients with complex medical problem. Medicine is one part. Looking after the whole aspect of the patient is the major goal. It's a holistic approach. It's not sufficient just to give medication, okay, why? We tell our patients that some of this medication, particularly for TB, needs to be taken with food. A number of them to say, what food? Okay, so we have to think about food parcels, okay, in this context. And here you are, okay, a number of very good you know, supply of food parcels. If the patient qualifies that they really do not have the financial means to buy food, they get a food parcels, okay, in the context to secure that sort of a supplementary, okay, context. Some of those individual things there, okay, are what we call high energy biscuits. And we have been talking a long time about high energy biscuits. It's not the normal stable diet biscuits. The normal stable diet out there is rice. And those of you among us who are engineers, food technologists, I would encourage you, okay, to research and innovate to come up with a high energy rice, okay? Because I think that will make so much difference, okay, in the people's quality of life. If you got very bad drug resistant TB, and this is what you end up to, okay, in a cubicle, okay, in the context. And this whole complex is actually built by a non governmental organization, which I have to give credit to, in the Medicine Sun Frontier, okay, because they have built these facilities for people who have got very highly resistant TB, which they need to be isolated. But if you just got MDR-TB, unfortunately, you can sh only share a six-bedded bay, but you isolate with face mask, okay, in that context. That's a cubicle of an individual with a very high resistant TB called XDR-TB. Right. How about Malaysia, okay, in terms of the young generation of you in the audience? Is there something that you can think about to innovate as well? Yes, this is just the end of my third month here in, back in Malaysia. I have spent practically most of my professional time out in United Kingdom and work in other resource countries. But there are work that is starting to actually emerge, okay, that one can undertake. This is a project 
that is led by students in the university that I've been seconded to in the village of Pulai, the health screening program, okay, which was very, very successful. It is me, okay, talking and uh, doing health screening, and this is where they get all their uh, cholesterol, okay, and then blood sugar check, okay, in the context. And this is where they take in the history, okay, in the context. And it's in terms of health, educa health education that is quite important in this respect. Okay, remember what I said to you about this five men that was described, okay, in, uh, with this particular unusual opportunistic infection. Advances have gone on during the past 36 years. There are even talk about ending AIDS, okay, not just in the medical journal, this is the economist, okay, talking about with all the advances that has happened, are you able to cure and treat AIDS eventually? United Nations AIDS has got a target and there's a mathematical model called 90-90-90 target, i.e. simply means that if you have got 90% achieved diagnosis for people who are at risk of HIV and if you can achieve out of that 90% that has been tested to go on treatment and subsequently those those on treatment 90% of them actually achieve what we call undetectable viral load on good effective treatment if you achieve it by 2030 you will stop the transmission of HIV so we got 11 years left to actually achieve that goal 90, 90, 90, okay? And I just want to actually leave you with that message for this next coming young generation because if you look at what is happening in the world as a whole, we have got 56.9 million people in H with HIV in the world. It's a figure that you probably, if you're not in my field, you probably think, wow, okay? You mean 36.9 million people in the world with HIV? Yes. 19.8 million have just been tested, 15 million people have just been treated, 11.6 million people that has got undetectable viral load. So we are quite far behind the target where we're going back to the break points. What I'm going to leave you with, these bullet points, focus on multiple disciplines in terms of fostering whatever you want generically and particularly in the healthcare settings we must always include the engineers, technologists, psychologists, the young generation of the future. It's very important to bear in mind that what works well in well-resourced countries may not work well at all in limited resource countries. I think you have heard a lot today from the other speakers about you need to think outside the box Think on, take on others' experiences and skills, okay, in the context. To me, access to basic health care is for all, not just for the privilege, okay, in the context that focus your mind onto it and delighted to be on this platform to actually share with you the concept of illuminating possibilities. Thank you very much.